May it please the Court, my name is Steve Keel. I represent the appellant in this case, Mr. McDessie. I'm joined today by my colleague, Elliot Schulder. Mr. McDessie was brutally raped and beaten in his cell by his cellmate at Wallens Ridge State Prison on the morning of December 21, 2010. This was an attack that was so severe, he required multiple sutures and spent 47 days in the prison infirmary. Let me ask you the posture of the facts in this case and how we ought to view those facts. There was a bench trial here, and now it's on appeal to us, and you're giving facts that, of course, are favorable to your client. Are those the facts upon which our review arrests? Are we to look at the facts as found by the court magistrate? I believe this is an appeal of the district court opinion, and the district court adopted the facts of the magistrate. But I also want to point out on clear error standard, this court has found that it does not only look at whether there was overwhelming evidence from the facts that an error was made, but will also look to the processes of the fact-finding process. And this court has said that if it is clear that the actual, whatever the actual facts may be, if the findings under review were induced by an erroneous view of the controlling legal standard, then clear error can be found. And here, the magistrate judge repeatedly talked about, in her report and recommendation... So you're telling us the facts with an eye toward whether the legal standard was incorrectly applied. That's correct. And it appears that the magistrate judge did not apply the full and correct legal standard here for deliberate indifference. She was looking to whether the defendants, whether the evidence showed the defendants did know, she kept saying, of the risk of serious harm to Mr. McDessie. And she did not look at whether the evidence, the voluminous complaints and grievances that had been filed, showed the defendants must have known. And because she did not apply that must have known legal standard, that is clear error, we believe, on that point. And the Supreme Court in Farmer v. Brennan and this court in Odom and a number of other cases... Are there any facts, any facts that the magistrate judge was operating on and the district court in adopting them was operating on? Any facts themselves, forget the legal standard for a bit, any facts that you think were clearly erroneous? The magistrate judge used facts that were clearly erroneous in and of themselves. The conclusion that the defendants did not know of these complaints and grievances and the attack as it was going on was clearly erroneous because there is an overwhelming amount of evidence. But that also puts a legal standard of should have known. I'm just asking the facts themselves. Did she say your defendant was in a certain place or that somebody else was somewhere else or did see or didn't see that you think is clearly erroneous in the record of this case? It seems she had the full record of facts before her. We're just saying that she did not apply the correct standard to those facts and that when looking at those facts and you have, you know, in the year leading up to this attack, 20 grievances, complaints, more than 20 letters filed, 16 of them specifically mentioning sexual assault, saying I've been sexually assaulted numerous times at this prison. When there is a state policy that says any employee of a prison, if they have a reason to suspect sexual assault, should immediately report it to their supervisor. When you have the supervisors testifying that, yes, I would be made aware of this, that complaints are sent to me, that if there's a security issue, I am aware of it, then it shows that these defendants must have known that Mr. McDessie was at a serious harm. What's your strongest argument that these defendants must have known? But what's your strongest factual argument that they must have known? Several of the complaints and grievances were copied to the defendants in this case. There was one in 2007 when Mr. McDessie first moved to Wallens Ridge State Prison where he said, I fear for my life. That was copied to Captain Gallagher, the defendant in this case. On December 9, 2010, 
just 12 days before this assault, Lieutenant Fields, the defendant here, was copied on a complaint in which Mr. McDessie said um, that uh, I will be intimidated into dropping this complaint just like the other complaint. So he's mentioning intimidation. Lieutenant Fields' name is on this complaint at uh, JA 273. And then in February of 2010, uh, there was a fight between Mr. McDessie's cellmate who attacked him, Michael Smith. This is before they were cellmates. Um, Michael Smith went into the cell of another prisoner and attacked him so severely that the prisoner required three stitches. The prison report on this attack in February 2010 states that Captain Gallagher, um was notified of this and met with Michael Smith to discuss this attack on another prisoner. Is your argument, is your argument that from the facts that were established as being known by these defendants, they should have known it was deliberate indifference? Or is your argument they should have known the facts somehow in the normal course of communication that from which they could then know there was a problem? Which is it? They should have known the facts or from the facts they should have known? It's the former. It's that they must have known that there was a risk here, that this is not just a few isolated So cases. in other words, you don't point to a you don't point to a fact that anybody specifically knew that would would put that, that person in a position that person should have known, even if he didn't know directly of the risk. Sure. Well, but that the, in the normal course of events, that person or those persons should have been informed of the facts. That's what you think. There's well, just it's, there's it's, a lack of communication in this case. It's, it's, no, it's, 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 it's more than that. It is that one of the facts is this 2007 complaint copied to Captain Gallagher from Mr. McDessie, in which he says, I, I fear for my life. So th that is a fact that shows that he must have known, not just that he should have known. We, and we know that Captain Gallagher met with his cellmate prior to their being cellmates and was aware that this was a, a violent predator with a history of prison infractions who was, you know, about half the age of Mr. McDessie, who was uh, a, a much higher security level rating, and they continued to leave in the cell together these two inmates. Mr. McDessie is 49 years old. He's five foot four. He has a history of back problems. They, you know, he is placed into a cell and left in a cell even after he has made complaints. Wasn't there evidence that there was some sort of prison policy that you separated, uh, you wouldn't put two people like that together in a jail, in a, that, in a cell. There's a yeah, prison policy that you're supposed to consider these kind of factors about the, you know, their, their, their age, their, uh, they rate them on a scale of... Yeah, we know one, about the scale. <laughs> one to five about, you know, and they were... You know, Mr. No 99s here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Smith was at the top of the scale, Mr. McDessie was lower on scale and much older and has this history of saying that, you know, I have been, he says, I have been sexually assaulted or physically assaulted by every cellmate I have had at this prison. He, he is trying every way he knows how to alert these prison officials to the fact that he is at real risk from his cellmate. It, it seems that what you are saying is that taking the facts as they are, if you look across it in, in terms of all it's there, the court should have determined as a matter of law that they must have known. That's correct. Well, I don't know that you I, – I didn't read your brief as going that far. Maybe that's one of your arguments. You sort of pose five or four theories you get from Farmer. And the one that was the obvious risk theory, it seemed to me that the Supreme Court did, in fact, in Farmer talk quite a bit about the obvious risk. Um, and here, and, and so the fact that there could be an obvious risk basis for recovery isn't just sort of a passing reference. We talked about it at length. If you should demonstrate that, then it seemed to be, if you should show circumstantial evidence of the obvious risk, then the prison official can come back and offer evidence why it was not an obvious risk. And I think the, the posture you're in now is you're saying that the district court, magistrate judge, 
didn't recognize the obvious risk factor that's, that's theory. But if they had, you wouldn't be necessarily, and even if they found there was an obvious risk, you wouldn't be entitled necessarily to judgment as a matter of law. Under Farmer, the prison officials could come back and rebut that. Correct? That's, that's correct. They could, but so we also a statement in what you said. <laughs> well, we also we also believe <laughs> that nice argument for you right there. If you didn't have that. You'd be, you would have been lost in the woods. <laughs> It's not, just well, I don't know about that. Uh, it's not just one person's word against another. It's not just Mr. McDessie's word against the word of these, of the prison officials who come back and say say something different. I mean, there is the there is this written record with this weight of evidence, and the magistrate judge even recognized during the hearing. She she interrupted the state during their closing argument and said, you know, over and over he's filed requests that reference numerous sexual assaults at Wallens Ridge. And she said, it just seems to me that there's no one at Wallens Ridge who either listened to this man or believed this man, anything he said. But, but that's, in, that, that, that's not inconsistent with deciding that the, these defendants didn't have that knowledge. That's just saying some, and it looks to me like somebody there certainly knew, but I thought she made a factual finding these defendants did not have knowledge of those prior complaints. Didn't she make that factual finding? She... I just, if you know or don't know. I, I believe she, she did, but we're, we're saying that, that she made that she was not using the proper legal standard looking at the, the fact that, that the fact finder can infer that there was deliberate indifference from the fact that the risk was obvious. Which the Supreme Court said. Which, and she, which, your position, I don't know if it's, your position is that she seemed to misread, too narrowly read the Supreme Court case. She, 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 correct. She required it as reading that there had to be direct actual knowledge, and she did not consider the second method of proving knowledge. Well, won't you take, just so I understand, just take 15 or 30 seconds, if you could, and state for me then exactly what your theory is, that the risk was obvious, that, that, that the prison had to know it? Based on the number of complaints filed, the clear language of the complaint stating sexual assault based on the state policy requiring that employees report suspected sexual assaults to their supervisors and based on the testimony of the supervisors that, yes, they would be made aware of these complaints. Therefore, it is obvious. That undercut, no, that undercuts the factual finding about who knew. That, 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 that just undercuts the factual finding that she, she just didn't, she just made a, finding that they didn't know, but you think she should have, it wouldn't be a factual finding, it would just be a, a legal determination that, that the prison was aware? I mean, what, what is that theory? That, that based on the weight of the evidence, that they must have known, they must have been aware that... These they, defendants? That, that the three, super, Captain Gallagher, Lieutenant Fields, and Sergeant King must have known. The other, the... There are three other defendants, officers, uh, Bellamy, Boyd, and Hall, who were on duty that morning. Officer Boyd was in the control room, which was just 30 feet, 30 yeah, to 40 Yeah, but, she, but she, I thought she found, that, didn't they testify nothing was different? Or oh, they'd walk past his cell and, and he hadn't said anything to him, and they served him lunch or something? I thought there was a factual basis for those on the scene. She could just say, I disagree with your testimony and I accept their testimony. Well, with for those the on the scene, did walk, one of the officer Bellamy did walk by the cell around 10:56 in the morning, about an hour before Mr. McDessie. Well, Brown Bellamy, was, Hall, and Boyd, she let out right away, and I mean the district court let her out right away, saying that there hadn't been an appeal with respect to them. You had, I don't, I know you didn't handle it then. So it seems to me they're in a, sort of a different category. They didn't preserve the issue. They didn't. They didn't take issue with the magistrate judge's um, well, findings. We, we, we believe that the I know you believe they did, but you have a better enough. case, shall we say, with respect to the other three. Absolutely. Would you agree with that? I agree with that. <laughs> um, but but we, we, we do believe that they did sufficiently object to the findings as to the three officers who were on duty. They talked about the testimony of all six defendants. They said each of these six did not uphold their sworn duty to protect uh, the safety of Mr. McDessie. Officer Boyd was in the control room, which was just 30 feet away, which is 
probably the, the width of this courtroom from Mr. McDessie's cell while he was being attacked and raped in a, a, a very serious attack. He, the pictures are in the joint appendix, and it just seems incredible that Officer Boyd and Sergeant King, who are both in the control room as this is going on, 30 feet from where it's happening, say they did not hear a thing. Uh, it, that, that's another instance where, where they must have known, where you have an, in, another inmate saying it was a loud fight. The officers would have heard this. Um, and um, there have been cases in... See, I don't think you get, if it, I speak only for myself, get anywhere disputing the facts. Yeah, but we're, we're based on a system where trial courts decide facts, and we don't, you know, unless you have a document that they've ignored, you know, you, you really, you just don't get anywhere fighting the facts. So it seems to me you are reduced, and I thought that you were going there, that you were only relying on misapplication of the law. So even though Boyd, who is one of the three that is out because he didn't preserve his arguments anyway, was in the next room, it does, doesn't go anywhere with me because the magistrate judge knew that and found as a fact that he didn't hear. So there you go. What, what your case has to rest on was that all of these reports and this policy made situation so that there was, in the words of Farmer, an obvious risk. And that it should have been put to the police officers, the prison officials, to rebut that. And they, they well may be able to. And, 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 and the magistrate says that, you know, McDe McDe in her report, McDessie contends that Officer Boyd should have heard or seen the assault. However, the evidence does not show that Boyd did hear or see the assault, as is necessary to make right. a showing it of deliberate. It's, it's actual knowledge, sir, right. as opposed On to that point being of able to infer it. As on, the Court on that point of law, we believe there's a clear I, error. I think we understand your argument. Let's hear from the government. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. May it Cox. please the Court. Trevor Cox for Lieutenant Fields and the other prison official defendants. The deferential standard of review here makes this a pretty easy case. McDessie cannot show that any of the lower court's findings were clearly erroneous. McDessie, like any inmate, had a heavy burden to carry in trying to what demonstrate. What about the, the posture that Judge Moss' questions have sort of put this case in on defense counsel? Right, if we look at the facts, we come to one inescapable conclusion. But do we go back and look to see if court applied the right standard, and if the standard that the court applied was they had to have actual knowledge as opposed to an obvious risk that would then put the, put the burden on the, the other side to show that it was not, that, that perhaps this could have been turned out differently, which would lead to the conclusion that if they didn't do the right standard, then they need to go back and do it the right way unless you can show something that even if you did the right standard, it wouldn't be any different. Yes, Your Honor. I believe that the factual determinations that were made, the credibility determinations that were made by the magistrate uh, after hearing testimony for two days and receiving 100 exhibits and examining a dozen witnesses and the viewing video is, footage. was the right standard applied? Even uh, if you, you believe that, but that's only if you accept that, that, that she applied the right standard. Did she apply the right standard? Yes, she did. Your Honor, uh, under what, none what of none of the standard? well, the Farmer case holds that uh, defendants cannot be cannot be found um, liable for an Eighth Amendment violation if in, unless they consciously disregard a substantial risk of harm. And uh, the Farmer case did go on to say that actual knowledge, um, actual knowledge is not necessarily necessary. That if there are long-standing, persistent problems that are so obvious that the defendants must have known of them, um, then perhaps there may be an Eighth Amendment violation. The That's not the case here. Did the apply an actual standard, actual knowledge standard? The magistrate judge certainly found that, that defendants did not have any actual, actual knowledge, um, and they also didn't find that, they, um, um, that they, they should have known. I mean, the... Did she find that there was no obvious risk? 
I believe. Or no longstanding policy. Uh, I believe. No uh, I believe you can fairly read that in the in the report and recommendation, Your Honor. It, it, do you know where it might be? Um, uh, if you give me a moment, I'll, I'll find it here. Did you think about this theory before you came in here? <laughs> uh, I, I did, Your Honor, um, and frankly. So, so if you did, then you would have known exactly where you would rebut questions from the magistrate report, wouldn't you? Uh, yes, the magistrate report is at, at um, you know, JA 970s and, and thereabouts. But, Your Honors, the, the evidence was so. No, but that's not what, that's not what I asked you. I said if, if the magistrate judge did, did address obvious risk, you said you thought about that before you came in here. I'm asking why wouldn't you know chapter and verse on what she said and where she said it. I think she, where the judge said it. Uh, I do you do know that or you don't know that answer? Uh, I, I, I thought I did, Your Honor, and that it was part of the um, okay. part of the findings that the court that the court made um, in its in its report and recommendation. What happens if it's not there? I, I believe that the, the factual determinations that the magistrate judge did uh, make, the credibility determinations she did make, um, are sufficient to tell to us show. how so. Tell us how so. Well, there's frankly just no evidence that defendants actually. Let me make sure I understand what you were getting ready to end. You, you believe they are sufficient to show that they would support a, a standard of obvious risk? Uh, yes, that, that they cannot be. Even though it's not there. It nonetheless would show what you're saying. That is but correct. Even if it's not there. That's so correct. Even if, even if the, it would defeat the obvious risk theory. Yes, Your Honor. Even if, even if the magistrate judge didn't explicitly say what that. What are they? What are they? Um, well, um, there's frankly just no evidence that the defendants knew that there was a substantial risk of harm to, to Mr. McDessey. Opposing counsel makes, a, makes much of the grievances that Mr. McDessey filed over the course of his time at the Wallens Ridge State Prison. But these are all very generalized allegations, um, for the most part, about sexual assaults that occurred in the past, years in the past. And the, the alleged grievances were actually requests that mental health help him uh, with the PTSD that he alleged that he suffered as a result of these past sexual uh, assaults. Um, so, for instance, the JA-254 is a report of a visit that he had with a mental health professional, uh, and he said that he, there was three incidents of sexual assault at Wallens Ridge, all in 2007, and, and they didn't involve rape. Um, and these are directed, these, these alleged grievances are directed to the warden, to the FBI, the ACLU, Amnesty International, um, everyone but these specific but defendants. Is there any dispute that he was assaulted, that he was beaten, that he ran out of his cell, and there was a the inmate was beating him. No, Your Honor, that's that's not um, that's not disputed. That there was a physical altercation. The district um, court accepted the magistrate's report and finding that an altercation did take place uh, on that day. Altercation when, with his cellmate and other gang members who were stabbing him and beating him at the uh, time. And he says he was raped during that time. Yes, he says that he was raped. There was no allegation of, of stabbing uh, in that that incident. That, um, there was a physical altercation that spilled out from his, his cell. He walked out of the cell uh, around uh, shortly before noon. Figure out, but it seems as though he then was taken either to medical or somewhere he was examined, and I guess the rape kit or whatever was done, they found blood in his anorectal area on, on his back, but they said it could have been from stomach problems or cramps. Uh, Yes, Your Honor. There, um, they did do a, a perk test, uh, and they found um, a little bit of blood in his in his rectum. But the testimony was from doctors was that it, it rectum, could have been. Or was it? I thought it was just there on the. I don't know if it was on his clothes or where it was. There, there's there's no there's no dispute that there was blood uh, in this altercation. Uh, he was bloody over his eyes, and there was some blood on the back of his underwear. There was no blood uh, um, in his genital region, um, but there were a few spots of blood found uh, in the anorectal. Um, sample. Um, but th there's no dispute that an altercation took place. It spilled out from the cell. Uh, Mr. Smith, his cellmate, there, filed him and started no, raining. There's no them. argument, is there, that the, that the prison officials were indifferent once he ran out of his cell? 
because then they immediately got there as soon as they could and fought, fired a shot over the head of, of the perpetrators. So that, there's no claim about deliberate indifference, at least from the time he ran screaming out of his cell. He doesn't make that claim, does he? That's right. That's right. I believe they've conceded that defendants acted appropriately, and certainly the, the magistrate judge found that they acted more than appropriately in light of the risk as it became, as it became known to them. What's at issue is um, what happened be before then. Well, let, me, uh, let me just stop and ask. Your answer is to the obvious risk theory is that there is no evidence that maybe somebody knew of an obvious risk. You even doubt that. But if somebody did know about an obvious risk, it was not these defendants. That's, that's because correct. Because they did not have the information about those earlier problems. That's that's correct, and can, I don't think it's. Turn, excuse me. Can you turn to JA 974 for a moment? This is the end of the magistrate judge's report, all close to the end, just before she makes her proposed findings and finds new liability. Although it does not change the ultimate recommended disposition of this case, it's worth stating that the evidence admitted at trial undoubtedly shows that. Mc how do you say his name? Uh, McDessie. Mc McDessie filed numerous grievances and complaints to various departments, and he wrote letters to the assistant warden and the director of VDOC alleging that he'd been sexually assaulted on multiple occasions while incarcerated. For instance, he complained, blah, blah, blah. One of these complaints he directed to, the, and it's also qualified medical responded. Also, it appears the standard protocol of separating inmates alleging criminal uh, sexual assault was not followed when he filed his offender request for information in 2010. I, I, I just think in light of that, it's almost as if the magistrate judge doesn't know that an obvious risk can, does not necessarily, but can state a claim. Uh, well, Your Honor, I, I think that this this sort of caveat, if you, if you will, or this this last sort of Which uh, paragraph. Which is consistent with, were you at the hearing? No, no, Your Honor. No, when you read the transcript at the hearing, um, it appears the magistrate judge is, um, <coughs> I, I think you're somewhat surprised with the conclusion that she comes to here. She seems more sympathetic with him. Your Honor, it's it's, it's clear that she's um, she believes that more should have been done uh, in handling the grievances from Mr. McDessie, but it's not clear. Um, well, I guess it, I will say it, it is clear that it doesn't change the ultimate disposition because these these defendants didn't actually know know anything. These grievances were directed towards mental health professionals, and in fact, she says, um, you know, he had not been able to receive mental health treatment, and then she quotes. Uh, mental health professional Clark for saying, hopefully, hopefully you will be well soon, instead of providing the treatment that magistrate judge believes that, that he needs. Um, with reference to the, the offender request for information on October 28, stating they had been sexually assaulted by a cellmate, that, uh, I believe it's at JA 971 and 972, uh, excuse me, JA uh, 271, 272. And this is, this is a document that's, that's in dispute. Um, there, there are two versions of this document. One of them, which clearly appears to have been doctored after the fact, indicates after saying, I have not been eating and I lost weight because of a few reasons. Then he adds, sexually assaulted by my current cellmate. Whereas the original version on 271 doesn't have that language. Well, if there so this is, is a dispute, it seems to be that she's, she's resolving it. I mean, we're letting it resolve every other factual dispute. <laughs> Um, Your Honor, that did not. Is, is, it your, is it your answer that those comments uh, the magistrate judge made there, what you call the caveat or the end, is that she's concerned that something happened? She's just made it clear, though, you can't pin it on these defendants. That that's certainly a, a, a reading that you could fairly take. That what other, reading, what other reading do you would take? You like? That um, they did that now? mental health mental health treatment should have been. Should have been provided to him, um, and um, and he wasn't he wasn't getting the, the treatment that he um, that he made. I don't need. think I don't see where exactly you get that. Well, for instance, uh, he suffered he allegedly suffered from post traumatic stress disorder, and then the qualified mental health professional Clark responded, 
hopefully you will be well soon. Yes, but that's a quote from what the mental health provider didn't give him any any treatment, but said, hopefully you will be well soon. That's, that's right. That's a quote from it. That's right. That's not I, the magistrate judge saying that there should be mental health treatment. Right. No, but I think that's the point, is that that's what the magistrate judge was concerned about, that more more should have been um, more should have been done for him. Um, you know, there's there's no there was no evidence to suggest that these these grievances were seen by these defendants. They didn't have they didn't have knowledge of it. Who set the policy for what happened with the, the grievance? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Who set the policy? What are the policies? Prisoner files grievances. What happens with them? Well, there there are different kinds of forms that you can you can file, Your Honor. And I'll, I will admit my understanding of this is is somewhat approximate. But see, I'm, I'm asking because if a prisoner files grievances and the answer at the end of a bunch of grievances, and this prisoner filed a number of grievances, is the defense then, we didn't know because we didn't look at it, or we didn't know because our policy didn't allow us to look at it in a way, the particular defense. Yeah. Is that the answer? There, there is, Your Honor, a policy that's compliant with, with the PREA Act of, of 2003. Uh, when there are specific allegations of sexual assault that are actionable, action is taken. These don't fall into that, that category. These are not specific allegations of sexual assault. These are pleas for help for PTSD for sexual assaults that he alleges to have occurred three years ago. No, no substantiation. Um, uh, so it's not clear what action would be necessary. I will say that there's, in addition Even to... with all of the grievances, the individual that he was put in that cell with, the one that we described, the beating, where they did everything they could once they found out, so to speak, uh, but the person they put him in there with was, uh, I guess he was a known gang member, and if, if I don't know if, if what he said was true or not, but that person had a bunch of things against him of all kinds of infractions he'd had in prison that would lead to a person who's very violent and very motivated to do sexual type acts against someone and he's much bigger than he was and yet he's locked in this cell with him. And that's the same person that ultimately is seen when the door finally opens, chases him out and beats him until someone comes up and stops him from getting beat on. And all this is in the context of these grievances that have been filed that you say did not rise to the level of doing anything other than saying, here's somebody with a problem. That, that's correct, Your Honor. The, um, what is correct? That um, there was a physical altercation, that uh, the cellmate did follow him out, but that was the first evidence of any um, any, that's any, what, any that's risk. That's not really what I'm going at. I'm, I'm really getting You're, at the business he put in there with this guy, but he has this series of grievances that are there, and maybe one grievance is something you can kind of kick aside, but if a person keeps putting in grievances, and I, I but, mean, isn't that, I mean, we're dealing with obvious risks here as opposed to if, if we take the, the posture that Judge Marsh read from the Joint Appendix that the magistrate may have thought that an obvious risk wasn't enough. You needed to have actual knowledge. But, but these weren't these weren't grievances against this cellmate. These these were grievances related to alleged sexual assaults that had occurred years ago. And in fact, the district uh, court, in the, adopting the magistrate judge's report, made no finding that a sexual assault had occurred. So what we're left with is. I'm sorry. I thought everybody agreed that there was a sexual assault here. The, um, the investigation that VDOC conducted said there was no sexual assault. Uh, and okay, I amend that. Everybody agreed that there was a beating that lasted three correct. hours. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, a, a beating that... Lasted some hours. I, I think there's, there's a dispute about that as, w as well, Your Honor. Uh, all, the state says it only could be 45 minutes or so. so I, I, no, I, take... I, I think what the evidence showed um, was that as soon as there was a... Um, a, a known risk, which was uh, which was known when he left the cell and his cellmate well, started when punching he's out. him. <laughs> he's already been they see he's already been punched and battered and bloodied and had some internal injuries as well by that time. So something had to have preceded that. Yes, right. 
Yes, but we... And the evidence is undisputed that they were alone together for, I thought, about three hours. That, that's correct, but for instance, the opposing but counsel is it, mentioned is it, that... Is it your argument that... I thought it was, I thought it was a state's argument that he was, he, he was beaten and bruised, but you, you thought it was basically some short period before he ran because... Don't you have testimony about these some defendants going by the cell and talking that, to him during the right. time period which there's an asserted, you know, long beating going on? But they say that he didn't say anything. He looked fine. So that's, you, I take it the state doesn't dispute there was an altercation. You just don't think, and you think the magistrate judge supported you that it was an ongoing. It wasn't a two or three hour ordeal that morning. That's correct. I mean, opposing counsel mentioned this that Officer Bellamy walked by at 10:56 a.m., looked in, saw nothing out of the ordinary, no blood, nothing. And this was on video footage that was viewed by the uh, by the uh, this by the magistrate judge. The context seeing. of this is that he's in prison and there are gangs there, and if you run your mouth, you've got a problem. Uh, and so some of this. Uh, at least from his perspective, is that you know he's being called a snitch, and every time that comes up, there's retaliation, and there are people in that prison system that do not take kindly to you saying to someone, an officer who walks by, hey, this guy in here has been beat me, or he's raped me, or that sort of thing, when you know he's a gang member, and then you also have, at least from their perspective, and I know this is not a light most favorable, but I'm just, you know, in terms of the obvious risk I'm going, you also know that if, if, if he says these things, that, that the officers are likely to do nothing, and if you do nothing, you are left in that prison with a bunch of gang people who are going to get you back uh, for what you've done. So there's this, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like he's just out in the general public and he's being beat up in an apartment or something. He yells when the officer walks by. He is in prison, and he is with gang members, and we know this. I mean that part about it, I think is pretty much obvious from from the record. <laughs> there are there are a few things that McDessie could have done if he were really uh, in, in danger. Could have asked for assignment to death row where he'd be in a cell by himself. <laughs> right. I'm I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, I will Probably say you would like it under these circumstances. <laughs> I, I won't comment on that either. The uh, what what I will say is that there's a policy that if he thought he was in danger, he could report to anyone there and say, I am I am fearful for my life. He says he did that. I know that they say he didn't, but he says he did. I mean, I've never seen a record with so many complaints. He, he filed them with somebody. I mean, then he didn't file them according to the state with the right person, so it was sent back. He he said a great great number of things. and the, Well, he said them in writing in a timely fashion. He did, and... Um, uh, uh, but none of those allegations were were substantiated, <laughs> okay. and and the magistrate judge declined to um, to give them credibility, as she was entitled to do. Um, so because of those credibility determinations and the standard of review here, uh, this court should affirm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Your Honors, I, would, I just would like to point out that the magistrate judge did apparently give credibility to the grievances and complaints based on her comments in her report and recommendations and at trial that numerous grievances were filed and that nobody listened to him um, and that we would request this case be remanded for uh, determination under the proper legal standard uh, that the defendants here must have known because the risk was obvious and it could that could be inferred from the evidence here. I have nothing. Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Thank you. Mr. Crowley, I understand that you all are court appointed, and we very much appreciate your efforts for your clients. You did a fine job. Um, we will come down and greet the lawyers and then go directly to our next case.